Hey guys, welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about checking the assumptions of the t-test. Now, so far we've talked about uh, many things regarding the t-test, including how to derive the uh, t-distribution from the t-score. So in, in that process, uh, we learned that essentially the t-distribution comes from the t-score, which is uh, like the ratio of two different, uh, two different random variables that follow. One follows a normal distribution, one follows a chi-square distribution. So the premise is this, that if we want to use the t-test, then we have to verify that it follows the, that the data that we're using uh, meets the assumptions of this parametric test. So we're gonna, talk about what are the assumptions. Uh, we'll talk about what is a parametric test. So when you hear the when you hear the words parametric test, it just means we have data that follows a certain parameter. Okay. Um, and, and in general, parametric uh, distributions or, or tests, hypothesis tests that are parametric uh, tend to be stronger um, because there are assumptions about the underlying data. Not, not every uh, test is parametric. Not every test will be parametric. And in the case that our data does not meet these underlying assumptions, we do have available non-parametric tests. In this video though, I'm just gonna specifically talk about checking the assumptions of the t-test. And then also uh, I, will, I will show you how to do that in Python. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the t-test is a very commonly used test. Uh, people use this for in academic writing, in, in research, um, and definitely in uh, business case scenarios. Business analysts might use this, data scientists, data analysts. Um, so it's a commonly used parametric test, and typically it's used for comparing the means between two groups. Uh, parametric tests, uh, like the t-test, are based on the certain assumptions that I mentioned, certain assumptions about the data. Um, and it's essential to meet these assumptions to ensure that the test results are valid and reliable. Okay, so uh, the t-test comes in different forms. Of course, we've got our one sample t-test, we've got a two sample independent t-test, and we have a paired test, a paired t-test. But regardless of the type, they all share some core assumptions that we need to verify before performing the, the test. Now, the assumptions, these are related to the nature of the data, its distribution and the relationship uh, between the groups being compared. So as we move forward uh, in this lesson, we're gonna explore these assumptions in detail and discuss why they're important for the validity of the t-test and by the end of the presentation, you should have a better understanding of the importance of meeting these assumptions and how to verify them in your data and how knowing these and using them are going to set you apart uh, from other analysts or other uh, data scientists who are, not, uh, who are not aware of these or who just don't use them, okay? And, um, and I mean, let me say this before I go forward. In some cases, uh, you can still do a t-test. Like for example, if you're if you're doing like an academic paper, you can still do a t-test, but you you must include the information. Uh, if you're so, say for example, your data did not meet the assumptions or it violated the normality assumption, which is which is not an uncommon thing to happen. In that case, you you still could go ahead and do the t-test and still go ahead and report it. However, you need to mention the fact that the assumption was not met, okay? So, um, so there's that. In fact, in, 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 my, uh, in my thesis, I had uh, done a t-test where my data wasn't, it was violating the normality assumption. Although we'll find uh, if, you, if you do some reading into the research that the t-test is, is pretty robust to violations of normality. So I did, 
I did both the T test and I did the Wilcoxon rank sum. I think it was rank sum test. I did a, I did the non-parametric equivalent, right? And and I got the same result, but that's just a something just to mention about that. Okay. So let me go on now. Okay, so what why is it important to meet the assumptions of the t-test? And why is it essential for obtaining accurate results? Um, the first thing is that if you want to have accurate and reliable p-values and confidence intervals, you're going to have to meet the assumptions because meeting the assumptions ensures that the p-values and confidence intervals calculated during the test are accurate and reliable. This means that the conclusions drawn from the test have a solid statistical foundation. So, you know, if, if the assumptions are not met, then that means that the probability density function that we're using, that we're integrating over to calculate the probabilities might not match the situation, right? So this is like the whole reason that we're able to use that PDF and generate a, a value by integration, generate this probability is because the data fits into that shape, right? If it doesn't do that, then, you know, it's the test doesn't really say much because the data, we're not able to calculate probabilities using data that doesn't fit these assumptions. Okay, so, so we have to ensure accurate and reliable p-values and confidence interval. The next thing is that it's going to prevent a biased or incorrect conclusions. So when the assumptions are met, it will help prevent this. How? Because violating the assumptions could lead to misleading results, right? And um, a lot of times people might prefer <laughs> misleading results because it supports their bias or their incorrect conclusion. So. So this is another, it's sort of like a gateway, right? Um, when you when you are when you have a stake in the results, it can be a problem uh, by, you know, if you just ignore the assumptions that you need to check <laughs> because you you really want your you really want your uh, results to be a certain way. So this if we have this norm, if we have people checking assumptions and such, then it it kind of serves as a way to, as a check. Not only that, but it, you know, just uh, empirically would be more valid. Okay, so also it guarantees a correct application of the statistical theory, meaning that the assumption guarantees that the statistical theory underlying the t-test is correctly applied. So this is crucial because the t-test's mathematical properties are derived based on these assumptions. So like I said earlier, it's just if the data, if the assumptions cannot be met, then it means that this probability density function can't won't necessarily be able to predict the probabilities because our data doesn't fit that particular shape. All right, so with the um, let's see here. Okay, so now, just a moment, something. Oh, okay. So now we can talk about the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem essentially is saying, if I have to boil it down in the most naive uh, understanding, is that if we have enough samples, then our data will approach the standard normal distribution, right? So this means that if the population distribution is not normal, the distribution of sample means will tend to become normal as the size grows larger, right? And so we can comprehend uh, why certain assumptions are important for the t-test by understanding the central limit theorem and other parametric tests, because it highlights the significance of sample size and the normal distribution. Um, if you have a normal distribution or if your data is approaching a normal distribution, then you're able to use the Z distribution to calculate probabilities, right? And uh, actually my formula here is a little messed up with that. That should be X bar here, uh, right? So, right, so then, 
this this idea that um, that are basically I'll, I'll say like this our data has to have a certain shape and the shape has to be the one that's described by by that uh, probability density function which we derived from the t score in previous video if it's, if it doesn't have that shape then we the probabilities that we calculate won't be accurate All right so it's like you know if i try to use the triangle area formula to calculate the area of a square right it's not not really going to work out okay so now we've we've talked about the central limit theorem just as a a way to think about parametric tests um we can move on to the t distribution which plays a which is how we're calculating the probabilities for the t-test. Now, um, using the sample standard deviation, um, because in real life situations, we don't know the population standard deviation. So we use this sample standard deviation as the estimate. And you saw in the previous video how this led, how this led us to the t-distribution. So the t-distribution, it's a family of it's not just one. Uh, it's not just one graph, right? It's actually a family of continuous probability distributions that are defined by the degrees of freedom, which are related to the sample size. So we have degrees of freedom equals n minus one, and so for each of these uh, different n values, you have different uh, t distribution shape. So it's similar, of course, to the normal distribution, but it has heavier tails accounting for the variability in the estimate of our standard deviation. It's because we're using the sample standard deviation. All right, so yeah. So we've seen the formula before, there it is again. And um, let's talk about these. So, so again, like what's the point of the T distribution? It's, it's what we use to calculate the probabilities we use the density the pdf when we when you integrate that pdf that's effectively taking a value plug it into the cdf which tells us the probability that some sample will be less than or equal to some particular value right and so if our data doesn't meet these assumptions then it's likely that it won't be the same shape or similar enough in shape so that the probabilities that we calculate won't be valid. So I guess the, the easiest way for me to explain it is to say, it's like trying to calculate, if your data is different shape, it's like trying to calculate the area of a triangle with the formula for the area of a square or vice versa. Okay, so let's talk about each of the assumptions one by one. So the first assumption is, uh, well, actually, the zeroth assumption, I'll just say this, this is just the assumption you should just automatically know. And um, if you go look this up on the internet, like what are the assumptions of the t-test, you'll find that this one often is not mentioned because it's sort of implied. So the first one is that, and, and also I should say, we mentioned this when we derived the uh, t-distribution. The, uh, the very first assumption is that the data comes from a simple random sample. Okay, so without that, then we can't go forward. So we do need to have a simple random sample. Um, the other next assumption is that we have continuous and numerical data. And that's because we're comparing the means, usually the difference in means. Um, the t-test rely on the concepts of, yeah, so that's what I just said. All right, sorry, <laughs> let's say it again. Um, and also we have the assumption, and this is where people get confused. We're not, we're not assuming that the data that we have, so, so when you do a t-test, what are you using? You're using a sample that you took from a population. So in data science, we, a lot of times we don't use this word sample. We just talk about our data, but it's important to remember. And, and when you remember this, all these other, things that I often see are missing from explanations in the world of data science that you would see in statistical textbook or something. Um, you have to 
you have to ensure that we remember that we're dealing with a sample that's coming from a population. And so in order to make the inferences back into the population, there's certain things that we have to check, including like these assumptions. So, so when I have a data set and I want to do a t-test, I have to check the assumptions and the assumptions are regarding the population from which the sample was drawn. So for example, one of the assumptions of the t-test is that the population from which I took the sample is normally distributed. Okay, so we're not talking about the actual data in my sample. I'm talking about the data from which I have drawn my sample is normally distributed. Now, on the other hand, if my data is, um, if the sample size is large enough, then the central limit theorem can help in approximating normality because the central limit theorem says that no matter what kind of distribution you take a sample from, if you let the number, if you let the sample size in go to infinity, uh, well, get larger and larger, <laughs> then the uh, the sampling distribution will approach the standard normal distribution. So the normality will be captured in that way. All right. So for the one sample test, uh, definitely we have to check to see if the data came from normally distributed population. And again, that's about just the shape, you know. Um, we have to make sure that when we calculate, when we find the area under the curve, it's the right curve. So we're finding the area of a circle or we find the area of a square. The central limit theorem, well, if we have a large enough sample size, the distribution will approximate normality. And so that's why I mentioned earlier that the t-test is robust against violations of normality, given the uh, given the, the good size of a sample, a good sample size. Okay, so uh, let me go back here. Okay, so for one sample, for one sample t, okay, so let me just say like this, for the one sample t-test, we definitely need to have a simple random sample. Our data is continuous and the population from which the sample is drawn is normal, normally distributed. Okay, so for the two sample t-tests, you're gonna also need equal variances. We call that homoscedasticity. Homo, homo I could usually say that, but for some reason, difficult now. So um, the two sample t-test assumes that the variances of the two groups are equal. Um, and if you're gonna do a pooled variance, which there's some arguments for and against pooled variance, uh, then you're gonna need that to be true. And this is the formula for uh, pooled variance, if you want to know what that is. Um, so now there's some controversy regarding should you use pooled or unpooled t-test. Uh, some people say that if you use the if you have the ability to use the pooled t-test, then you should use that because it's gonna be more powerful, um, right? So, but you do need to have the equal variances in the data. And then some people say you should always just go ahead and use the unpooled t-test where uh, you can calculate the variances separately for each group because that's going to result in a more conservative test but it's just, it should be the default because of the fact that it will be more conservative. And then typically we call this the Welch's t-test. And I think this is the one that uh, if you do the, I think it might be the default test in R and maybe even Python, I'll have to check, I'm not sure. Okay, so the definitely there's been a debate about which one you should use in the literature. Um, some say the pool t-test is more powerful and should be used when it's reasonable. And others say that you should just use the unpooled t-test because it doesn't require any assumption of equal variances. Okay, so in order to check this, we're gonna use something called Levine's test. We're not gonna use the F-test. We're gonna use Levine's test to check for equality of variances. And if you have equality of variances, 
then you can use the pooled t-test. Otherwise, use the unpooled t-test. And then again, some people will just say, just always use the unpooled. And so basically, whatever you do, just make sure that you understand it and in that if you're in a situation where it requires you to document it, that you thoroughly document it, everything you're supposed to do. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch my screens here and I'm going to just try to write down a bullet point list of uh, assumptions. Well, actually, I think I had that already. And, uh, and then we'll look at a practical example here. Okay, so let me just switch my screens. All right, so let's see. Oops, now I can't see that. Hmm. Ah, there it is. Okay. So let's talk about in detail each of the assumptions and not only the assumptions, but how we're going to go ahead and Wow, this thing's amazing. Hold on just a moment. Okay. So we'll do, we'll just go through one by one here. Oops, it's not the eraser. Okay, so first we'll talk about the one sample T test. And what do we have to hear? What do we need here? We need definitely need that our uh, data is from a simple random sample. So a, we definitely need the randomness, okay? Um, we need that our data is continuous or numerical. Well, that's kind of redundant. So we'll say continuous. Um, and we need that it's drawn from a normally distributed population. Okay, so it has to be, which, which then would imply that it's uh, normally distributed itself, right? <laughs> okay, so the test for this, um, Basically, there's only two, there's only one test we need for this. This is in the experiment design. Uh, this also, it's pretty obvious, right? Is it continuous or not? And then the test for normality is going to be the Shapiro-Wilk test. And I do have a, I'm working on a, a series about this test because it's actually pretty interesting. And in the series, I'll explain the how it works and, and its origin and everything like that. But this thing uses a W statistic and it follows a special distribution called, I think it's called the Shapiro-Wilk distribution. <laughs> but one thing you have to uh, pay attention here is to the uh, null and alternative hypothesis. Okay, so for the Shapiro-Wilk test, the null hypothesis is that the data is drawn from a normal population. So the, the sample comes from a population that's normally distributed. And then normal population. And then the alternative hypothesis is that it's not. And so what, what I see happen, which is kind of weird, I guess just a honest mistake sometimes is that in this case, if alpha equals uh, 0.05, if P is greater than alpha, then that means that, that our data probably comes from a normal distribution. So um, I don't wanna say it like that. So if our, if our, if our, if our P value is greater than alpha, then we, fail to reject 
H not here, right? Which is that the data is drawn from the normal population. So when you do the superior well test, if your p-value is less than alpha, that means you reject the null hypothesis, meaning that your data is not a good candidate for the t-test. All right, so that's the for the one sample test. Uh, for the two sample test, we've, of course, we've got two different kinds. We've got our oh, I can't. we've got our independent samples and our paired samples. So I'll start with the independent. And the first two, um, the first two are going to be the same. We definitely still need simple random sample. And we definitely still need our uh, data to be continuous. And then we're going to use our superior Wilk again to test the normality for both of our uh, samples. And in this case, we also need homoscedasticity. So we can just say, I don't know, why would we need to say homoscedasticity when we could just say equal variance? Um, <laughs> I'll have to look that up. So we need the equal variances, which we can check with uh, something called Levine's test. Okay, and we've already talked about Shapiro Welk, so let me just tell you about um, Levine's test. Uh, so for the Levine's test, the null hypothesis is that the variances. Variances are equal. And the alternative hypothesis is uh, they're not. <laughs> OK, so that's really, I wouldn't write it like that, uh, but it's kind of being lazy. So the hypothesis, no hypothesis, the variances are equal. Alternative hypothesis, they're not equal. So that means that. Alpha, whatever your alpha is, whatever you choose your alpha to be, um, if P is greater than alpha, then that's going to support the null hypothesis, which means that our data is a good candidate for the T test. So if the P value, if P is less than alpha, then reject. Uh, assumption not met. And so you could either go ahead and do the t-test and then mention that somewhere in your work if you're not worried about invalidated results, <laughs> or you can uh, go ahead and uh, use a different test, right? Which is not difficult to do. Okay, so that's our, our uh, independent one now for our paired test. So for two sample. Okay, so we've got the same ones again. We've got simple random sample. Uh, we've got um, numerical again. This one, there's some, well, there's, I guess this is kind of like in all of them, but in this one it's in particular, we have independence of observations within, within the sample. But of course, they aren't going to be independent uh, between uh, one sample, I guess I'd say like this, in the before and after, they're obviously not independent, but in the before, each of these observations should be independent. And actually, you know what, that's, let me just erase that because that's just true for everything. So, so it's really not special here. It's just kind of implied. Okay, so here we also are gonna do a Shapiro Wilk. And we also gonna want, uh, let's see. In this case, we don't really need to have, um, 
I'm going to say that we definitely need the observations to be paired. And we could go ahead and do Levine's test here. Okay. And so these are all parametric tests. So what happens if you if your data doesn't meet these assumptions? Well, then you can do non-parametric tests if you have to check the uh, if you want to compare means or if you want to compare medians even. So the non-parametric you're going to be looking at using uh, the man. Whitney U test uh, for independent samples. And then you're going to look at the uh, Wilcoxon. Wilcoxon, how do I spell that? C O X O N. We signed. Rank test uh, for paired samples. And you could, I think you could use that one for both actually. Or in the, your other alternative is try to use some kind of data transformation. Okay. So now let's go to the practical here. So I want to. Change my screen. Just a moment. And let's see here. Let me just move one thing out of the way. All right. And I'm just gonna do one more thing before I switch my screen here. All right, let's see if I can get a new share. Perfect, okay. So now we come to the practical part of this uh, lesson here. All right, so we're gonna check the assumptions. So I've already uh, imported my data here, this custom return data set. And so again, you have to remember that when you have data like custom return data, typically, I guess it's possible that you could have every customer's information, but typically you're taking a sample. And if you're not taking a sample, it's not a bad idea to take samples uh, and then take multiple samples, even if you have access to the whole population. Um, right, uh, just to do cross-validation. So let's go ahead and import the modules I'll be using. I'm going to use pandas. I'm going to use uh, Seaborn. I'm going to use matplotlib. I don't know why it's not giving me. And they're giving, that's weird, did I spell it? No, I didn't, okay. And I'm gonna get NumPy. And this time I'm gonna just bring in SciPy, that's stats and stats. Okay, let's go ahead and bring everything in and then I'm gonna go ahead and designate my data set, my sample. So this is a sample of the population of customers, right? Okay, and let's go ahead and take a look at it and everything like that. So uh, in the next video, what I'll do is actually do the t-tests, right? But in this video, I'm gonna check the assumptions. So, and the first test I'll do is a test, so, um, a one sample t-test to check the to check the average age of our customers here. B 
because the marketing department assumes that the average age is 40 for the population in our sample has an average age of 36. So we're gonna to wanna to do a one sample t-test. And so therefore in this practical, I will demonstrate how to check the assumptions for that test that I'll do in the next video. Okay, so number one, we need a simple random sample. Uh, that's the first assumption, which we, hold on, this is not text. So uh, one sample t-test assumption. So number one, we need a simple random sample. Number two, the data should be continuous, which it is, so it's, we're using it. Our data is age. And number three, the data are approximately normally distributed. So, I mean, i.e., they come from a normal population. This drawn from a population. Okay, not a population, that'd be like a population of dogs, population, okay. So the simple random sample, that's just in the data collection, we're assuming that's met. Uh, the data are continuous. Yeah, we're gonna be checking about age. Age is definitely a continuous variable. And the data approximately normally distributed. So that means we need to do the Shapiro-Wilk test for normality. Okay, so Shapiro-Wilk test for normality. What do we have? We have that. The null hypothesis is that the data is drawn from normally distributed population and alternative that it is not. Okay, so there's a couple of ways we can examine for normality actually. And definitely Shapiro Welk is the most reliable, but you also can expect inspect your data uh, by looking at a histogram and by looking at a QQ plot or what we call a quantile quantile plot. And this plot allows us to see how closely our data fits a theoretical uh, data set that does follow normal distribution. Okay, so let me just go ahead and we'll go, we'll go through this and look at how to do it step by step. So first of all, I'm going to just uh, check the normality. So I'll say normality check with the Shapiro-Wilk test. Okay, so then uh, the Shapiro-Wilk test, we imported that when we did the, uh, it's gonna be in this package here. So we've already, we've already handled that part. So I'm gonna say stat one, this is gonna capture my W statistic. I'm gonna say P1, that's gonna get my P value. I'm gonna say stats.shapiro. And inside of Shapiro, I'm gonna put the uh, data that I'm interested in testing. Okay, there it is. And then I'm gonna print off, let's see, I'm gonna print off my W statistic. And I'm going to print off a little message here that says, Normality, zero book. And here I'll say my p value is uh, p1. Okay. All right. So then the next thing I want to do is visual inspection. So, you know, usually whenever this is taught, you're, you're taught to look at the histograms first and you're taught to look at the QQ plot. And for some reason, and I don't know why, maybe it's just me, but like every time I've, I've done this or taught it, it seems like I always get the counter example where, <laughs> where the data looks like it's normal and then we do the Shapiro Welk test and it's not. Or the data doesn't look like it's normal and we do the Shapiro Welk test and it is. So 
that's so I'm, I'm leery about visual inspections. And I always tell people, don't let that be the last or only check that you do. Make sure you check uh, statistical tests as well. Okay, so not that statistical tests can't be wrong. It's just that they are less likely to be wrong. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these two side by side, which is why I'm using subplots here. So I'm going to have one and two. And I'm going to set the size up to be 10 by 5. All right. So then I'm going to get my, let's see, did I do that right? I always forget equal sign right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is get my histogram. So it's going to be SNS. It's in the Seaborn package, SNS, histplot, DF. And then we're going to get our age here. And then I'm going to say, uh, I want the kernel density estimator. So KDE equals true. And my axes, I'm going to put this one first. So it's going to be at index zero. All right. And then I'll say, let's say I want this to be title to be histogram. Okay. And then now the next thing I'm going to do is create my QQ plot. And it's kind of similar. So if you pardon me while I uh, save time <laughs> and just go through and change some uh, things. So it's going to be stats and prob plot. So this is going to give me my QQ plot. Um, that's going to be the same. And then I'm going to change. There's this. Don't need that. And then I need plot instead of AX, X is zero. And I'm going to change this to a one and this to a QQ plot. Okay, and we'll say PLT dot show. All right, so now let's check what are we going to do here? Basically, it's a one sample T test. So these two things. Uh, this is in the experiment design. Uh, this is the nature of the column, which is age. So definitely it's continuous because it's time. Um, and then the only real test we need to do is to check for the normality. So I go ahead and run this and I get, uh, what happened here? <laughs> Hold on, something ain't right. What did I do here? Hmm. Interesting. It's supposed to be, this guy is supposed to be over here, <laughs> but somehow it's over here. Let me just check, what did I do? Hmm? Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense because I put it in the wrong place. Okay, that's much better. All right, so now let's examine this thing. So we've got a W statistic of 0 0.988, which might not be very meaningful, right, to, to you um, or to most people who haven't studied this test statistic <laughs> or that distribution. But our superior Rilk returns a p-value of 0 0.5. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that our p-value is greater than alpha, which in this case, alpha is 0 0.05. And so that means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. What's the null hypothesis? It's that this sample data is drawn from normally distributed population. So we do not reject this hypothesis, right? So it means that our, our uh, our data has passed the test and it's a candidate for the T distribution. And now let's look at our uh, graphs here. So hold on, let me just make this just a little bit smaller. Okay, so our histogram, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it does have the look of being normally distributed. Okay, yeah, I'll agree with that. And definitely the QQ plot, you can see that the blue the blue points are very close to the red line, which is what you're looking for if you have data that's normally distributed. Now you do have this right here, 
uh, which could indicate something like a uh, maybe an outlier, perhaps we could check that with a box plot. Let's just check it. Yeah, not really any outliers, so that's fine. Okay, so next we're going to be looking at our two sample t-test and we're looking at, okay, so to sum up, I just tested the assumptions to be able to do a one sample t-test to determine if the age, if the mean age is different or, or uh, less than 40, which I'll do the, I'll do the actual test in a subsequent video here. Okay, so now what I want to do is show you how to test for two sample t-test. and the assumptions. Okay, so again, we, we have the, uh, the data are from a simple random sample. And then we have the data are continuous. Spell, is that right? I don't know. And then we have the data um, are, approximately normal. And then we have equal variance. We have almost scedasticity. Okay. All right, so we need to do, in this case, we need to do shapiro wilk test, but we also need to do the Levine test. So what does the Levine test do? It tests for equal variance. Okay, so let me, um, let me just grab this. So here we've got our null and alternative hypothesis for Shapiro-Wilk and for a Levine test. We've got a similar situation where we, we're kind of wanting to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and set it up. So again, we can do the test and... Um, Just a moment here. Oh, yeah. So we can do the test and then we can also examine the graph visually, All right? So here, uh, what I wanna do is check the assumptions so that I can test to see if the total purchases across uh, gender are different. So where is, that? why can't I see? For some reason I can't see gender here, but I can guarantee that it's definitely in this data. Uh, hold on. Yeah, so we definitely have gender here. And if I go like this, I can see what kind of uh, levels I have. So I've got male and female gender. So I want to do a... Um, two sample independent t-test to see if there's a difference between the total purchases of males and females. And so what I'm gonna do now, I'll do the t-test in a subsequent video. And what I'll do now is check the assumptions. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is create two uh, sub sets of data. So I'm gonna go ahead and get all of the male total purchases. So gender, equals to male, and then I want total purchases. And then I'm gonna do the same thing uh, for email. And change this to data two. Okay, so this is gonna generate these two subsets basically. So the first thing I need to do is check for normality. And I think what I'll do is uh, recycle this and then just multiply it times two, make life easy. So I'm gonna take this down here and paste it here. 
and just change a couple of things like um, this can stay the same, but I need to change this. So this is gonna become just data one. And then I'm going to do it again, except this is going to become data two. And I'll just change these two from one to two. Actually, you know, I just feel better about it. it doesn't really matter, but let me just change these two uh, twos. Even though in Python, it will overwrite it. So like whatever the last thing you named something is what it will be. That's right. I just want to do like that. Okay, so then this one, everything in here is going to be, this is three. And this one also is three. Okay, so that's going to be my check for normality for both of my samples. Now I'm also going to need the Levine test. So I'm going to check for homoscedacity. Homoscedacity, sorry, homoscedasticity. All right, using Levine's test. Levine's test. And for that, I'm going to take uh, stat four, P4, and then stats dot Levine. Very easy to do, right? Oops. Well, and we're going to take data one and data two. Okay, now let's get our visualizations in here. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to do this again. I'm going to grab this and multiply it, separate and multiply it. Okay, so let's see. What I'm going to do here, I need two histograms and I need two QQ plots. So I need to change this to be two. And I need to change this. So hold on, let me change. I'm going to make two of these. And so like, you could also make two of them like this, right? So make two of these. Oops. Control Z, thank goodness for Control Z. All right, and so here is where I need to pay attention. So the first one's gonna be zero, zero, because I'm making uh, two columns and two rows, okay? The next one's gonna be zero, one here, and then I need to change the input. This is going to be data one. It's lowercase one, data one, and we don't need that. So I'm putting data one here. KDE is true, that's fine. And actually, let me get rid of that here. And we're gonna say histogram for data one. Okay, and then down here, get rid of this. Say data two. And here, I'm gonna say data two, okay. So that should take care of those and make sure that the axes are set up correctly. So here, this is a zero comma zero, and this one is zero comma one. And so down here, when I create these two, I'm gonna have one zero and one one. All right. So here, we're gonna get data one, and this will be one comma zero. Same thing here. And we'll say data one. And then down here, this will be data two. This will be zero, I'm sorry, one comma one now because I'm on the first row, first column. Remember the indexing starts at zero for, and this is data two. All right, now that should be everything. And let's go ahead and run it. So we've got, first of all, I create my subsets here. And then I check them for normality, check for equal variance, 
and then visual inspection. So let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got um, W statistics 0.97. So the normality for the first one, which I probably should have said, hold on, let me just change one more thing. We'll say like this theta one and theta two. Okay, that makes me, that's going to be better. All right. So for Data one, which is the total mail purchases, or the yeah, our p value is definitely bigger than zero point zero five, so we do not reject the no hypothesis. Um, wait a minute, what's happening here? Hmm, there's something here. Oh, let me see if I can fix this. What happened? Let me try one thing here before I get to the graphs. That's better. Okay. So the both data sets are um, candidates for the t-test because we failed to reject the null hypothesis of our Shapiro-Wilk test, meaning that it would, it's like it's highly probable that our data comes from a normal distribution. From a data from a population that follows a normal distribution. Okay, where's our Levine test at? Hmm? Where's oh, I guess I didn't print that today. Oops. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and print that. I'm just gonna do like this. And for this, we get uh Again, our p-value is greater than alpha, so that means that we fail to reject the uh, null hypothesis, which means that the null hypothesis fail to reject that the variance of the different groups um, are equal. So it passed the normality test, it passed the uh, test for equal variance. Now. now let's examine the graphs. And so just looking at the graphs, looking at this KDE, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard for me to say what looks normal and what doesn't look normal anymore because I've fallen into that trap so many times. I just prefer the superior Wilk now. <laughs> but sure, it looks sort of bell-shaped. It doesn't very look very symmetric, but it does look kind of bell-shaped. I'll give you that. And then looking at our QQ pots, plots, uh, this one goes away a little bit, but for the most part, these blue dots are close to the red line. That's what we're looking for. All right, and, and we had our, uh, Levine's test was very nice also. Okay, so now I come to our um, paired plots, our paired, not paired plots, <laughs> our, two sample paired test. So let's see what we need to check here. Assumptions. So again, we need the simple random sample. Two, we need continuous uh, data, continuous variable. Uh, three, we need normality again, but in this case, we're talking about the normality of the differences. And then we also need what? Um, let's see. Well, okay, so if we're talking about differences, just think about this for a minute. If we're talking about differences, do we need normality or is it uh, the same as our one sample t-test? Okay, so do we need the Levine test? Mm. Yes, actually we do. <laughs> so we're gonna check to see if we have homogeneity of variances as well. 
Okay, so let's go and put that down. So it's another way of saying homoscedasticity, homogeneity of variance. Okay, so here's our assumptions. Now, we can use the QQ plot if we want to. We can do, so we can do all the same things as before. And because of that, except there's one thing that's different about, and that is with the normality. Okay, so, and in fact, also let's see. So what I wanna test here in the next video is I wanna test if there's a difference between the total purchases before and total purchases after a marketing campaign. Okay, so I can see there's a, the mean does look to be different, right? Um, but I want to see if that mean, if that difference in the means is statistically significant, right? So in other words, um, does, this, does this sample represent a statistical, does this sample, represent the population um, in such a way that it's telling us the marketing campaign caused a decrease in total purchases or is correlated with or something. Okay, so anyways, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting a little tired. Okay, so we wanna know, is there a statistical, statistically significant difference in before and after? purchases, right? Because what we have here is a sample data drawn from a population. And even though you can see there's a difference, we need to know, is there a statistically significant difference? Right. Okay. So meaning we're making an inference. We're using probabilities. All right, which means it's more verifiable and reliable. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So first thing I need then is the, um, the, the before and after purchases. So I'm gonna say uh, before was, so I need like a subset. Well, why did I call it after, it's before. <laughs> before and one more I need the after and I'm going to be testing their differences right okay so my first assumption I'm going to check the normality of the differences. So that means let's define the difference to be um, after minus before. All right, and let's see, stat, which one is this? I call it five, I guess, <laughs> step five, P5 equals, we're gonna use stats.shapiro and then differences and make a little print statement. We'll say W, how about equals, W equals stat five. And value. Oh, I put the F in the wrong place. Okay. And the P value is E5. All right. So that should work. Uh, this is called diff, not differences. All right. Great. So now we're going to look at the second assumption well i mean not well okay the fourth assumption 
I'm going to check for homogeneity. Now, one other thing you need to do here. Yeah. Okay. One other thing you need to do here is make sure that the samples are the same size. If they're not the same size, then they can't be paired. Okay. So actually, we'll do that first. Which actually, I know that they are, but let's just let me just show you how you can do it. So if before the length of before is not equal to the length of after, I'm going to say print the samples are not paired. All right. So it should be paired in order to be to do a paired <laughs> test. Okay, now um, let's see. Now, and that's something you you know a little piece of code you might want to have in case you're just trying to automate all of this in some kind of a pipeline. Um, so now let's check for equal variance. We're going to do Levine's test. So we'll use stat six p six equals stats dot Levine. Oops. There we go. And we're going to say after before and print out the result. So we'll say, hmm, actually, yeah, so P equals P6. Okay. And I think before, did I say, did I do that? Let me just check one thing here. Yeah, okay. I did not. All right. And then uh, if we want to, we can also examine the plots. We can look at the visualization. And I'm going to just go up here and grab this to make it easier, recycle, reuse. And I'm just gonna replace uh, age with diff. And same thing here. Okay. So we're looking at the differences, right? Of the uh, before and after. So that's the one basic thing that's different between the, um, when you're checking the assumptions, when you check the two sample independent t-tests, you just check the two samples individually for normality. When you check the paired t-tests, you're gonna check the differences. All right, so we've got p-value is 0 0.01 which is definitely larger than 0 0.05. And a p-value for a Levine's test, hold on a second, let me just write this. Uh, let's try that. Okay. So for our Levine's test, we also have a value that's greater than alpha. So in each of these cases, if the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis for the Shapiro test is that the data came from a normally distributed population. And the null hypothesis for Levine's test is that the variances are equal. So in this case, both of these uh, have passed, they felt all the assumptions are passed. And so our data is a candidate for the t-test. And looking at our visualizations, we've got our nice histogram here. It's probably the nicest one so far. And our QQ plot, you can see we've got most of our data hugging the, the uh, red line, although we have some little, some little things going over here. Uh, these, these guys kind of varying off. So we can also look at the box plot of this. And we're looking at this, yeah. 
look at the differences. Yeah, we've got a couple outliers. Okay, all right. So that's it for this video. Uh, in the next video, I will show you how to do the t-test that I mentioned. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be it. And then I'll have a couple more videos after that. I've got, I, I think I did say I would create some tutorials on how to do the same things in R using R Studio, and then also a um, couple of bonus videos about how the t-test is used in linear regression models and in uh, correlation test. And then actually, you know what? I haven't done any confidence intervals, so I might do that also. Not sure yet. So that's it. Hopefully this helps. And thanks for watching. If you have any questions, comments, or if you notice any mistakes that I made, or if you notice any misunderstandings I have that I'm not aware of, please let me know.